explanation of that. We'll go all the way from the input to output and stay within the physical world. And there won't be, so to speak, in, in you know, the middle of the neurophysiological textbook, a blank chapter saying, uh, well, actually, at this point, a miracle takes place. You, you will get all the way from chapter 1 to chapter 14, shall we say, connected explanation. And that's one way of talking about the physical world being causally closed. So have your experiences been in there and do, do stuff. Yeah. I'm only presenting you with a problem. You know, I, I, I say, unfortunately, I won't even have time to solve any of these problems for you. <laughs> but I, I'm trying to get you a sense of what it's all about. You know, what, what, why people get worried about, you know, what, why do people say consciousness is a puzzle? These are just a few of the reasons. And then this question of what's the function of consciousness? Uh, by, by the way, what time did we start with? Okay, so let me get for 10 minutes. Good. Good. Um, well, these days, uh, you can't, you know, living in the UK, you can't have been deaf to the fact that the Darwinian evolutionary theory is rather large and, and, and has. Uh, uh, kind of predominance in, in certain scientific quarters, in many scientific quarters. And so anyone who's kind of coming from this tradition, uh, you know, wants to say, all right, we've got consciousness, um, because it's kind of quite large, it's not a tiny thing for us, um, in order for it to be there, it must have had a function in biological evolution. Um, um, if you look at the literature, and I have for decades, um, when people were trying to formulate their <coughs> thoughts about all this, for instance, in cognitive psychology, you find that consciousness has been associated with every phase of human information processing by one or other theorist, all the way from input to information transformation to output. So, you know, I've listed a few here that. Um, you know, you need consciousness whenever you have something that requires a lot of it, that's novel or complex, and you need it to provide feedback, you need it for memory, and learning, language, problem solving, and so on. And in a way, all those things sound plausible because you might think, you know, for instance, without it, uh, if I weren't conscious, how can I speak to you? Well, if I have to be conscious in order to speak to you, maybe consciousness is necessary, necessary to me to speak to you. Not an unreasonable thing to think. That's wrong. And one of the reasons, um, um, you know, again, I can't, can't kind of really unpack it for you, but I can give you an indication of why, why that's wrong. Um, well, okay, I said something about speaking. Uh, actually, the truth is, um, although you know what I'm doing is consciously speaking to you. If I actually reflect on what I'm conscious of, I hear the sound of my voice, see this hand waving, I have a kind of sense of whether what I'm saying is making sense or not. But the first point at which I'm conscious of what I'm saying or doing is when I hear myself speak. So by the time I'm conscious of it, it's already happened. It's come too late. And if you think of how complex it is for you to understand what I'm saying, and you think, Am I really consciously working it out, or just kind of getting a feeling that I'm with it while I'm not with it? And you're almost about to. You're as unpreconscious, all that's happening preconsciously, and then you're, you're conscious of whether you follow me or not, in the same way as I'm conscious of what I'm saying once I hear myself speak. And there's an entirely different reason for saying this as well, which is that if you're, let's say, you're a, a cognitive psychologist and you're trying to work all this out, and you develop a detailed model of, say, speech production or speech perception. And you produce a model. And the model is, you know, within modern psychology, it would be something like a model of human information processing, which has, I don't know if every one of you has seen these models, but they're kind of boxes with processes in them, and, and information flow between boxes. It's, it's really a systems of analysis of what's going on. And if you really could, for instance, work out how speech is produced or speech is understood, should be on a program onto a computer, which, you know, 
if you've got the model right, you should be able to speak and understand the speech, otherwise you've got the model wrong. And the only thing that you ever find in these models is, is information processing as it's viewed from the outside. It's rather like a functional version of the only thing you can see if you're looking at the brain from the outside. All you see is neurons. Once you've got that explanation in information processing terms, you still don't have any gaps. You, know, you still don't have a blank, a blank chapter. And so you start wondering, well, hang on, what, what is the function of consciousness? Now, in the end, I would say, look, there's a much more interesting answer to all these questions than, than you know, those that have been set up in this sort of way, but I don't know how far I'm going to get with it. You know, we have to look more to see. Now, see. Okay, what sort of, if we quickly go into the business of what forms of matter are associated with consciousness, how wide is consciousness distributed? And you look at the literature, you go all the way from what you might call the most anthropocentric answer, and, and have said this, although less so these days, but for many years people, you know, if you like, the academics working in this area would say, well, the only people, or the only creatures that we can be confident of, certain of, that are conscious of other human beings, and therefore you should, we should be dubious about everything else. So that's the most anthropocentric answer. And, and, and in a way, that also links to ancient theological doctrines, at least in the West, that only human beings have souls. Yeah? And so it's kind of, you know, almost a, there was almost a kind of conversion between that kind of theology and that kind of science. And, but there are equally other kinds of answers, and, and these days they're starting to gain in, in popularity, which says, actually, consciousness is very widely distributed. Maybe we're not unnatural, maybe we're not freaks. Maybe the way we are is natural, and nature is a bit different to the way that we thought it was. And so consciousness might be somehow fundamental in the nature of nature. And we're just one manifestation of it. And that, 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 that would be a view that would attract me. But again, as I say, I really won't have time to defend it. In fact, I'm only going to get time to introduce the whole area, you know, and the whole of what I was going to say is going to have to fall by default, uh, probably. Anyway, what you might do in this area is actually start investigating the brain and see what's happening there. And the facts of the matter are that although there's a large body of work devoted to that and big machines, you know, and quite a few of them are just around the corner at the University College, uh, you know, some very good labs looking at precisely this issue, we still don't know. We don't know what the necessary and sufficient material conditions are for there to be any experience in still blank. Although we know a great deal more, of course, about the brain than we used to. Well, um, basically, and this, this, you know, although I'm running out of time, this is where I start, you know, in a few minutes, beginning to talk a little bit about my own interests and my own take on some of this. For a start, you know, I'm, I'm only going to say a little bit about what consciousness is. How do you go about answering that question? And one of my own critiques of the theory is precisely that it starts off with the theory and then tries to put the phenomena into the theory. When actually, you know, that's not the way one normally starts with, shall we say, any other phenomenon in science. Normally you start off with the phenomena. And in the case of consciousness, you're talking about the entire phenomenology of consciousness. And um, actually, um, this dualist, I, I, I'm going to, because I've got so little time, I'm going to flip straight into a little bit of, of the, you know, telling you something a little bit different. Um, now let's go back slightly. Remember I said, you know, we start off with a kind of dualist view as a kind of default position. That was the ancient view, starting with Plato, and was often what what natural science opposed. Um, in, in this dualist way of looking at the universe, um, you, you, sorry, I think you're the um, you, you assume that there's a separation between this kind of thing, this is a material object out in the world, and there are light rays that travel from this cat, which is a material objective thing, 
and stimulate the visual system of an observer, which produces neural representations of the brain of the observer. And then other things happen in the brain which support a conscious experience. And then the observer has an experience, which is a person that comes into the mind of the subject. But you can see that there's splits here, that everything below this line, if I were to draw a line across here, is physical. So the cat's physical, <coughs> the head of the subject's physical, and the brain of the subject's physical. But the experience of the line is, is on the realm. That's dualism. Yeah. And there's another split. Everything to the left of this line, on this way of looking at things, is, 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 ob is the object. The cat is the object. And everything to the right of the line has to do with the subject. So you've got a subject-object split and a consciousness material world split. And basically, modern science and philosophy have tried to oppose that by reducing that to a state of the brain. So that's materialist reductionism. You know? and, and basically, if you could get that in there, you, you, you get rid of one of these bits, you'd say, oh, well, the whole world's material. But you're still left with another script, which is that everything on, on the left of the diagram is still you know, to do with the object, and everything on the right of the diagram is to do with the subject. So you get a subject-object bit. And basically, I want to say that's wrong. And the reason I want to say it's wrong is because, in other words, all this is wrong. Because that's not the kind of things that we experience. And, and I want to replace both those models with something that looks a little bit like it, that looks a bit like this. <coughs> so actually, um, if that's a cat out there in the world, and these light rays are traveling to the central nervous system of the subject, and various things happen in the brain to support the subject's experience, and then the subject's response about what they experience. They should say, not, oh, I've got a seeing cat in my head, or an experience you know, that, that seems to be nowhere. They should say, well, I see a cat out there in the world. And if I'm a cat, for example, and you just attend to your own experience of me, and I ask you, describe your visual experience, you should be saying, well, uh, there seems to be a chap out there with a striped shirt and he seems to be waving his left hand about and you know, he's walking up and down the room. And uh, actually, if you examine your own experience, visual experience, not what you feel with yourself, but your visual experience, that's all you experience. And, and actually, it's this phenomenal world that you experience. So I'm just not an isolated experience, I see this shirt on stage. And um, 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 this seems to be in the room. And your body is also something you experience that seems to extend down to the floor, feels in a certain way, and seems to be in a certain location. And that's starting to put a completely different complexion on things because everything that I've been talking about, you know, this body that you see out in the world, is. is on the one hand, part of your experience, but of course, false of which you know, it's physical. So, this is where the journey begins. You know, am I physical or am I psychological? And, and then you can ask the question, how could all this come into being? So, somewhere before this experienced world comes into being, lots of things have happened in your mind and brain. You know, there are things all around us, and there are things that interact with all the things around us, and all those things are interacting pre-consciously, rather like, remember when I said, you know, when I speak, or I think of that as a conscious, experience, conscious speech, everything's happened before I'm conscious of what I'm saying. Everything that's happened as you consciously experience this room, to do with visual perception is happening before you experience it, by definition. So what kind of universe are we living in, which interacts with itself in this pre-conscious way, 
in order to generate this view of it.